uh, from the uh, waiting room. And uh, good to have you all join us today. We've got a, a high powered lineup of, of uh, experts today to explain the USDA NAS August crop report. And this, uh, again, the webinar is brought to you by the Indiana Soybean Alliance and the Indiana Corn Growers Association. And today's sponsors are Bex Hybrids and the United Soybean Board. As we continue to let folks in, uh, Rachel, you tell me when uh, we've got uh, we got the folks in, we'll get started. But again, welcome. Uh, glad to have you all here today for this important update. While we're letting people in, I'm going to go ahead and run a membership video. As a world leader in corn and soybean production, Indiana farmers are faced with persistent risks in the ever-changing global marketplace. With your expanding to-do list, there's no time to think about trade access, regulations, infrastructure, or crop insurance in the state house or DC. So, who is fighting for you? Who is going to battle for Indiana corn and soybean farmers? That's where we come in. We're the Indiana Corn Growers Association and the Indiana Soybean Alliance Membership and Policy Committee. We work on the issues impacting Indiana farmers. We protect market access and crop insurance. We stand up against excessive regulations, unfair tax policies, and slanderous attacks by anti-farm groups. We are champions for fair trade, renewable fuels, infrastructure improvements, and a robust Indiana livestock industry. We engage with legislators and regulators to educate them on how Hoosier corn and soybean farmers have led the way in water quality, soil health, and conservation efforts. But in order to fight for you, we need your support. Checkoff funds cannot be used for lobbying purposes, so your Indiana Corn and Soybean Joint membership is critical to overcoming harmful ag policy, regulatory overreach, and misinformation. There is power in numbers, and we're on your side. Now, more than ever, it's important to join with your friends and neighbors to champion Hoosier farming. Together, we can use the power of corn and soybeans to make Indiana ag stronger. Join today at incorn.org. All right, Steve, take it away. All right, hello everyone. Welcome again to the lunch break webinar. Uh, today's uh, report is, or today's webinar is going to be on the USDA crop report. Just a few housekeeping items. Uh, mute your microphone if you're not speaking, just to reduce the the background noise. We will capture all questions in the in the chat feature. So, uh, and for uh, Mr. Honing's uh, presentation, uh, he is a very very busy in the, uh, today, as you can imagine. Uh, so he's not going to be with us the entire time. So after his presentation, we will ask the questions of Mr. Honing. And if you can't hear the computer audio, try switching to, to the phone. Uh, a lot of times we find that if you're having trouble with computer audio, the phone, phone works well. Next slide, please. Uh, just uh, run through the agenda here. We're going to have uh, Ed Ebert, our Senior Director of Grain Production Utilization, um, uh, moderate the, the meeting with the, uh, with the speakers. Uh, Lance Honing, the Crops Branch Chief with USDA NAS, USDA NAS. Uh, Ashley Fisher, Media Relations Coordinator with Bex Hybrids, our sponsor, and another sponsor of USB, Mac Marshall, uh, Vice President of Market Intelligence, will, uh, will join us as well. Will Sawyer, Lead Economist uh, on Protein with CoBank, and Mr. John Bays, a Consulting Economist with USEC. So Ed, uh, please introduce our special guest, Lance Hogan. Great. Well, it was uh, quite the report yesterday, Lance. We appreciate you uh, taking time today to be with us. Um, Lance oversees all the crop estimating processes at USDA's National Agricultural Statistics Service as the Crops Branch Chiefs. This includes more than 200 official USDA reports covering acreage yield production price and the value of more than 100 crop commodities. In addition to his many other duties, Lance is also uh, very busy on the report day in lockup because Lance personally briefs the Secretary of Agriculture or his designate and the chairperson to the Agricultural Statistics Board. 
Lance, we really appreciate you taking time today from your busy schedule to meet with Indiana farmers and stakeholders. Um, and again, this is an important report uh, because the August report, and we're, we've been very fortunate here in Indiana to always get to go to the August report because it's kind of like the uh, benchmark or the pace setter for following reports. And as Lance will be leaving as soon as he is finished with the question and answer session, please get any questions that you have into the chat feature of this conference. Lance, tell us more about the report that came out yesterday. All right, well, thank you, Ed, and hopefully you can hear me okay. I actually got disconnected a few moments ago and, and had to dial back in, uh, so I'm not sure that it recognizes who I am, but at least it's letting me talk. So I appreciate the opportunity to come and share a few thoughts with you. It is unfortunate that uh, with the situation that we're in today that we couldn't do some of these things face-to-face, -face, but I think everybody's done a good job of adapting to uh, being able to inter interact in this this other way. So if we go ahead, I'll, I'll walk my way through the slides here. And uh, you know, I'm trying to keep my comments pretty brief so that uh, we can have plenty of time for Q&A. I think that's really the, uh, the greatest advantage to these kind of discussions is for me to get an opportunity to answer the questions that you have. So if we can go to the next slide, uh, I always like to uh, just remind folks who NASA is and what we're here for. And of course, our mission statement really sums it up. It's to provide timely, accurate, and useful statistics and service to all of U.S. agriculture. Um, and in order to do that, we publish a lot of information. Yesterday was just one of many uh, reports that we put out. Uh, you can see about 500 reports nationally that we put out every year, about 120 crop commodities uh, that we focus on. So that translates to me uh, being about nah, roughly 200 and some reports uh, that my staff puts out every uh, year. And so if you break that down and take out the weekends and holidays and things of that nature, I mean, you, you quickly realize that it's not that far from a report a day uh, that we're putting out. And so uh, yesterday was just one of many uh, pieces of information that we uh, we provide each and every uh, day here at NASS. So if we go on uh, to the next slide, I had just a couple of other things I wanted to share. Uh, I always like to also touch on a little bit about why USDA estimates production. And I say USDA, I didn't just say NASS here, uh, because we're not the only folks involved in this process. Um, but really, you know, it, it's about what the bottom of the slide says. It's about leveling the playing field. And I know it doesn't always feel like that sometimes, but the bottom line is there's going to be information out there. There is. And the question becomes, is everybody going to have access to that information or, or is it going to be a series of haves and have nots? And I think from a farmer perspective, uh, you know, if you look at that little uh, graphic at the bottom, which, which side of the teeter totter uh, would you be on? Are you going to be the individual who has access to that information or not? And, and I'll let you make that decision, but the bottom line is that's what USDA brings to the table because everything that we produce is made available to everyone at exactly the same time. That's what the lockup process is all about that uh, Ed mentioned. It's about making sure that absolutely no one gets early access to that information. And so it, it provides that. And then the other thing it does is it brings everybody back into alignment. So there's a lot of different opinions out there and the USDA reports really become that grounding uh, rod for, for all that information that's floating around and kind of resets the scale uh, moving forward. Obviously, it does get used for a lot of purposes by a lot of people. Uh, it can be everything from a day-to-day -day marketing decision to, uh, you know, it gets used very heavily in designing and implementing programs, including Farm Bill programs. So as we look across USDA, uh, so some of our biggest partners are right in-house at USDA. They need the information to administer those programs. Uh, that they're carrying out uh, to help benefit producers all across the country. Uh, the next slide, um, really, I just want to touch on this very briefly. August is a great time, I think, to provide the reminder uh, that there's really a couple of different sources of information throughout the growing season. Uh, this graphic really focuses on corn and soybeans, and I want to talk a little bit about the the partnership and the difference between the World Ag Outlook Board and NAS, or put another way, the WASDE report and the crop production report. Um, as you can see by the graphic, uh, whether you're talking about planted acres, harvested acres, yield production, or ending stocks, there is information on the current crop season starting all the way back in March. Uh, but where that different piece of information comes from 
uh, can vary throughout the season. So planted area, that's pretty much NAS all year long from March on. And, and let me just say that anytime NAS publishes a value, uh, the World Board adopts that value in the WASDE report for the U.S. But as you can see on the graphic, NAS doesn't necessarily have every number all season long. And so sometimes the number that you see published in the WASDE report, it absolutely is a USDA number, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's a NAS number. And I bring that up now because occasionally when August rolls around, for example, uh, that becomes the NAS yield, first yield and production forecast of the season for crops like corn and soybeans, but the WASDE's had one for three months, but it's a different process that they go through. And so sometimes when you see a change from what was published in the WASDE in July and what NAS publishes in August, it raises a lot of questions, but the reality is the process is completely different. Uh, NAS is relying on information from farmers, sometimes from uh, you know, objective yield survey work that we do. We look at satellite information and the WASD leading up to that point is typically relying on weather information and trend analysis. And so I'm not saying necessarily that one is, is better than the other, um, but the process is different. And I think you need to understand that when you start thinking about the differences. The other big difference you'll see is the ending stocks. I just had a conversation about this on uh, another meeting that I was speaking at just a few moments ago. Uh, questions about ending stocks and ending stocks, you know, NAS measures stocks on a quarterly basis. So we don't measure the quote ending stocks until we actually get to ending stocks. And so when you're talking about ending stocks today for this season, that's a, that's a WASDE number that's coming from the World Ag Outlook Board. And so they have a different process for forecasting out what that is than what NAS is going to actually measure in the bins. Uh, when we finally get to that point in September. So that's just a little bit of background in terms of who we are and what we do and some differences across USDA. Uh, with that said, let me talk a little bit about yesterday's report and I'll open with the same thing we opened with the briefing for the Secretary, Deputy Secretary yesterday. Um, and that is that just a quick reminder that this is nothing new, but NAS forecasts of uh, yield and production each month are based on conditions as of the first of the month. Uh, we put a gray box on the front of the report yesterday to make sure folks had that reminder before they even got into the data. It's obviously very relevant uh, for what we're talking about right now. Uh, and so we were very specific in that note and pointed out that that is the case and that any potential impacts from severe weather that occurred after August 1st, and I think we all know what that weather was that I'm talking about, uh, will be reflected in future reports. So the production forecasts that were issued yesterday uh, that was based on conditions August 1st, and therefore any impacts that come from the derecho event this week were not reflected in that report. And that's by design, that's by policy. Um, and quite frankly, uh, we're probably fairly fortunate because we would have never had the time to even begin to adequately measure that impact uh, in time for yesterday's report. Uh, Equally important to the data, um, I'm a big proponent of this is understanding the process. That's part of why I'm here to answer questions. Uh, that's part of why you'll find me in lots of other places talking about this uh, type of information as well. And that is, I think you've got to understand where the information came from and you have to understand how we put it together. And so the very first slide that I always share with the secretary before I talk about the numbers themselves is a slide very much like this where I make sure he understands where the information is coming from. And that's what I wanna do for you today. And so for yesterday's report, we had three pieces of information feeding into the production forecast in that report. Uh, the first, of course, was what we would call our Ag Yield Survey. And of course, that's an operator reported survey. Uh, you can see we reached out to just over 20,000 farmers uh, roughly uh, July 30th through August 6th, and we asked each one of them to provide to us their expectation of yields for the various crops that they're growing this season. Now, you look at those dates, and I'm sure that probably raises a question in your mind already that I just finished telling you that it's based on conditions as of August the 1st, but now you're telling me you collected data through August the 6th, and that is true. Uh, but we also asked folks to focus in on uh, first of all, try to dial back to what was happening August 1st. But even more importantly than that, uh, let me just say that that's a, you know, roughly a seven, eight day uh, data collection period. Uh, but the vast, vast majority of that data comes in at the very beginning of the reporting period. 
And so we need those extra days to make sure we can get adequate reports. Uh, but the bottom line is by far the majority of that data would have come in July 30th, 31st, the first, maybe the second. Um, and so it's very heavily focused around the first that's done by design, but three or four days isn't enough. Uh, to necessarily get responses from all 20,000 producers. So that's why you'll see a slightly larger window there. And of course, in this particular case, with that event happening on the 10th, it's really a non-issue in terms of worrying about whether you had any impact spilling over into the reporting. Uh, secondary to that, we did have, uh, if we go back a slide, I'm sorry, uh, we did also have objective yield uh, work, but only for winter wheat this month. And you can see the sample sizes there. Um, obviously, for corn and soybeans, that's going to start leading up into the September report. We used to do corn and soybeans in August as well. We stopped that beginning last season. Uh, the reason we did that is for efficiency purposes. And we went back, we studied the data that we've had for many, many years. And what we found is, although that information was helpful, uh, we can do just as well in August without that information for corn and soybeans. And so it just makes sense from a financial standpoint not to commit those resources that early. Uh, the crop just isn't that mature. And so we found that the data we got from the farmers and the satellites was far better than what we got from objective yield that early anyway. Um, and I mentioned the satellite information. Yes, we do have that. We do use it, especially for corn and soybeans. Uh, from a technical standpoint, you can see we're using time series 250 meter MODIS data. Uh, we really focus in on the Corn Belt. We utilize imagery uh, through August 3rd. If you think about it again, you talk about those dates. Um, that satellite imagery doesn't come around every day and every hour. And so you've got to kind of pick your dates carefully. Uh, we have August 3rd because that allowed us to ensure that we were picking up coverage uh, through August 1st, which was our reference date. So if we move on, I'll just try to quickly run through uh, some highlights from the report. I know at this point you've all seen the numbers. You've probably heard about the numbers. I'll share with you a little bit what I shared with the secretary yesterday. Uh, and, and so that's kind of the routine that we use. I share these very same slides. And so for corn, uh, you can see 92 million acres planted this year, 84 million expected to be harvested. That's up 2.6% on the planted, 3.3% on the harvested. No change though. Uh, from what we published back at the end of June on acreage, and that's the normal routine for NAS. We typically don't change acreage uh, between the acreage report and uh, this August crop production, but it is our first yield forecast of the season. 181.8 uh, bushels per acre. That's up 8.6%, just over 14 bushels higher than last year. That is a record high uh, forecasted yield for corn this year, as is the 15.3 billion bushel uh, production number. So you can see 12.2% above what was produced last year. And at the bottom half of the screen, if you're interested, you can see uh, just how the top five states ordered by production, how they compare to what was produced last year uh, for corn. So if we move on to the next slide. Here you can see the, uh, the corn yields over the last 30 seasons. We put a trend line in there on the gray line for you again, as I pointed out as I'm sure you're well aware, record high corn yields expected as of August the 1st. So we'll move on. Uh, the next slide is uh, an interesting look at what's happening with yields across the country. The way this map is laid out, the top number is the current yield forecast for corn. Lower number is a percent change from the final yield last year. Uh, any state that's colored in any type of blue is increasing from last year. Any type of red is decreasing the depth of the color. Uh, reflects the amount of the increase or decrease. So those darker blue colors, those are bigger increases, the darker red are the larger decreases. Anytime you see a pound sign next to one of these numbers, it indicates that's a record high. And so not only is the national yield expected to be record high this year, but we're forecasting records in Georgia, Kentucky, Michigan, Minnesota, New York, South Carolina, South Dakota, Tennessee, Washington, and Wisconsin. So looking at a good crop uh, across a big swath of the country this year. Uh, moving on to uh, just a snapshot of some of what we're looking at with the satellite information. And so what we do is we utilize uh, that sat satellite imagery to model uh, yields. And you see the results of that here for corn. Uh, and the way this map works is those darker bluish colors, the more blue you get, or if you were to even get into the purples, that's going to be your higher yield. And so we think this is a nice image to share because it provides you an even, uh, even more detailed look 
and how the yields are varying across the growing region. And of course, uh, we're not just using a map, but we're getting very hard facts uh, behind the scenes that tell us how this feeds into the various state yields that we published yesterday. So great information to supplement uh, the information that we're getting from producers. Uh, the next slide is just a quick snapshot here of how the 15.3 billion bushels compares. I already mentioned it's record high, uh, but here you can see exactly how that compares over uh, the recent seasons. Um, the next slide, uh, the last one that I have for you on corn. Uh, this is always interesting. We'd like to share this with the secretary just to uh, help him be prepared for what kind of reaction there might be. And so what we see here is a comparison between those pre-report published industry expectations for corn production uh, compared to what the NAS forecast was yesterday. So each of those blue dots represents one of those industry uh, members published expectations. The red block that you see on there is the NAS forecast. Now let me just point out uh, that we do have folks that gather these uh, pre-report guesses for us. They file them away. We don't access them until after we've set the numbers and begin to put the report together. Uh, we want to have them available to share with the secretary, but we make sure we don't have them or look at them before we start setting the numbers. So I don't want you to get the impression that we're trying to put ourselves anywhere in particular related to what folks are thinking. We separate ourselves from that part of the process and let the data uh, speak to what the forecasts are going to be. Uh, but nonetheless, it's always good to know uh, once the report goes out the door what kind of phone calls we're going to get. But more importantly, we want to make sure the secretary is aware of what kind of feedback he might be getting or need to be prepared to respond to. So here you can see uh, the forecast for corn yesterday, a little bit higher than most folks were expecting, but it did fall within the range of those expectations. So uh, next slide, I'll quickly run through a, a similar set of slides for soybeans, and then I'll be ready to wrap up and move on to the Q&A. Uh, for soybeans, again, just like I said, for corn, no changes to the acreage, either planted or harvested from what we had previously published back uh, in the acreage report at the end of June, more than 10% above. Of course, last year we know was uh, not a good year, and, and we're just happy to be moved on from that. But soybean yield, uh, we're forecasting 53.3 uh, bushels per acre. That's up 12.4% from what last year's actual yield was, or 5.9 bushels per acre higher than last year, and much like corn, it's a record high. Um, looking at the production, not a record high there, actually second highest production on record, but 4.42 uh, billion bushels there, but of course the big increase after last year's uh, significantly challenged crop. And at the bottom of the screen, again, if you're interested, you can kind of see how those top five states uh, compare for acreage yield and production to last year. And here, of course, no surprise, increases all across the board on every aspect of soybeans for the top five states this year. Uh, the next slide uh, here again, just gives you a quick look at yield. Obviously, we've already talked about the fact that it's record high, uh, but you can see exactly uh, kind of how that compares the previous high for soybeans back in 2016 it was 51.9 bushels per acre. So pretty, uh, Pretty significant increase above the previous record as well. And if you, you know, from just some of the comments I've heard since the report yesterday, uh, you know, a lot of folks think that uh, maybe the sky's the limit on this crop. So it'll be interesting to see what happens in the upcoming months. Uh, next, we'll take a look at the soybean yields by state and how they compare uh, with last year. And boy, you don't, you don't have to worry too much about different colors on this map because not only are we uh, up in all but two states, but really we're, we're pretty much utilizing the deeper blue here because we're looking at big increases again after the challenges last year. Uh, once again, like they talked about for corn, all those pound signs next to the numbers, we're looking at record yields not only nationally, but in a lot of states, um, Illinois, Indiana, Kentucky, Michigan, Mississippi, Missouri, Nebraska, Ohio, and South Dakota. Those are all expected to be record highs this year. Um, not that uh, this group is terribly interested in Pennsylvania, but anytime you see some such an anomaly on a map, I'm sure that raises some eyebrows and wonder, you know, did we forget to uh, increase yields in, in Pennsylvania this year? But uh, the, the weather, you know, weather can be a funny thing. And in Pennsylvania, they just, it, it's been hot and dry, unlike even areas around them. And I'd also point out that if it still seems strange to you, uh, that's actually still not only the sixth highest yield in Pennsylvania, but it's only two bushels below the previous record. So uh, still a very good yield. Uh, so I think we can say all across the entire growing area, very strong yields this year for soybeans. Uh, next, we'll take a, 
a quick look at some of that satellite uh, generated yield information for soybeans. And again, um, the, the color scheme just helping you to identify where the, the high points are. And, and really, when I look at this graphic, I think, um, you know, I, I feel like I see a lot more uniformity. In other words, I think this reflects what we saw on the previous map that we're just looking at good yields all across uh, the growing area. Not really a whole lot of hot spots, uh, either good or bad, just really good crop. Uh, next, just a, again, a quick look at kind of how that production stands up. As I mentioned, second highest on record, but if you look at uh, both 18, which is the record, and 17, uh, you know, 17, 18, 20, we're looking at pretty comparable production numbers there. Uh, last year's anomaly sticking out like a sore thumb uh, on this graphic. And then uh, last but not least, when it comes to soybeans, uh, the next graphic will show you a uh, little bit more of a surprise here. And so, you know, yeah, it, it's really interesting because the pre-report guesses uh, not as high as the NAS forecast, obviously. You see the red block above all of those dots. But yet a lot of the commentary since yesterday has already been, boy, I wonder if this crop will get even bigger. So it's just, it, you know, when a crop's big, it's always uh, hard to get a handle, I think, going into a report on exactly how big it is. And so going back to the beginning of my presentation, I think this helps uh, set the marker uh, for folks to get some concept about exactly what kind of crop we're looking at for soybeans this season. And if I'm not mistaken, I think that's the last slide uh, that I have. I think the next one just, oh, I, I did want to mention this. Um, if you go back one, obviously this event happened yesterday, uh, but I want to make sure I mention this because this is just another avenue that I use to help communicate with folks on an ongoing basis um, every month after, so after every major crop report, so occasionally twice a month, um, I will host what we call stat chat. So that means that at one o'clock Eastern time, an hour after the report's released, I spend some time on Twitter uh, specifically answering questions that anybody might have. Yesterday, I spent about an hour out there uh, just constantly answering questions that folks had about the report. Uh, just another way to try to make myself available and be as transparent as I can about the process and provide uh, whatever feedback folks are looking for. Um, so even if you don't want to ask the question yourself, a lot of folks will get out there and follow along. Uh, there might be a question you were either thinking of and didn't want to ask, or it could be you hadn't thought to ask the question, but you'll, it, it's all in full view. Um, so you'll be able to see all the questions and answers that are circulating out there. Uh, as I mentioned, obviously yesterday's over, but September 11th, when the next crop production report comes out, I'll be back out there again, uh, one o'clock Eastern time, taking any questions that folks might have. So that is the last slide that I had, uh, other than my contact information. Um, in addition to the Q&A here that we're going to do now, uh, you guys, anybody can always reach out to me. I'm happy to uh, do anything I can to help folks understand the process and answer any questions that are out there. So uh, that's the last slide I have, and I'm ready for, ready for questions. All right. Well, thank you so much, Lance. And for those of you that haven't been to lockup before, what you just heard is a very small snippet of what the actual Secretary of Agriculture hears. So you can all kind of say that you've kind of been to a lockup now, a little bit, that's on the, uh, the, the conference call today. So Lance, our first question is regarding the uh, corn and soybean damage that was experienced out in uh, uh, the west, you know, west of us here in the Corn Belt earlier this week. How will USDA NAS account for this damage and which report will quantify that damage? So there will be a lot of uh, different ways that we're going to get a get a handle on that. You know, the most immediate thing that you're going to be able to look at is the crop progress and condition reports that come out every Monday. And obviously, that's not going to quantify uh, the actual damage because that does not provide yield or production numbers. Uh, but those condition ratings, it, I think the first, you know, hard and fast data that we're going to have is going to come Monday afternoon. Uh, when we see what kind of impact it has on the condition ratings in that report. So that's the quickest thing that we can do. Uh, a couple of other things that we're going to do, we've got uh, folks uh, at NAS who have already begun to work on uh, utilizing some satellite imagery, some of our cropland data layer information to help measure the scope and the impact that way. So that's, that's a way of identifying just how big of areas impacted. We'll lay some uh, wind swath maps over that to find out not only how big an area was impacted, but try to identify some zones in there 
uh, in terms of where the strongest and heaviest impact might have been. And so these are some of the quicker things that we can do to help measure the magnitude of the problem. Now, when it comes to actually quantifying the true impact, whether that be acreage or yield, that's going to take a little bit longer. Uh, but fortunately, we've got a couple of weeks before we gear up for the next crop production report. And so I think in many ways, the timing works in our favor that way because we're set up to uh, to get back out there and survey farmers again at the very end of this month leading up to the September report. And I think after a couple of weeks, I think that's going to help folks have a better handle on what that impact might be. Um, it's going to, in many ways, it's going to take all season to fully comprehend, I think, what some of the impact is. But boy, a couple of weeks from now, I think folks are going to have a much better handle because we're going to be able to even visibly see uh, in a better way how much of the crop is uh, going to be able to respond and how much of it isn't going to be able to respond. And then from there, that's that portion that's able to to survive it's going to be a little bit trickier the rest of the season, I think, getting an accurate handle on what that yield is. But that's why we've got multiple tools to measure with. So we're going to keep going back to farmers and asking them. We're going to continue uh, to access updated satellite imagery to model things that way. But in addition to that, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to get enumerators out into fields uh, starting around the 25th of this month. They're going to be going into fields. And that's going to give us some boots on the ground, capturing some real-time information as well. So we've got a lot of information coming in in the next few weeks that's going to help us shape that. So look for crop condition numbers this coming Monday for immediate uh, information about what might be happening. And then the next real look at production side of things is going to happen on September the 11th. All right, perfect. Lance, typically or historically, how close do industry estimates compare to NAS estimates? Well, you know, it varies. I mean, sometimes they're they're spot on and sometimes you'll see. In fact, look at the difference between corn and soybeans uh, that I just showed you. you know, on corn, really fairly comparable. I mean, obviously the NAS number was a little bit higher than probably the average of those guesses, but it certainly fell in that range. But look at soybeans. And in this particular case, uh, no one no one who published uh, a pre-report expectation had a number as high. And so it just it can vary uh, from from month to month, crop to crop, and um, you know sometimes it's it's really close and sometimes it's not. And typically, uh, that'll give you a pretty good measure of what's going to happen uh, with prices the next day. Um, and so that's part of why we like to we like to see that. But you know, as I mentioned, we're going to let the data uh, drive the decisions. That's the value that we bring to the process. Is we're not we're not setting our numbers based on uh, just what other folks might be thinking or seeing, but we actually let the data drive that, and that, and that I think recenters everyone. And if if you looked at one of these graphics two months from now, I think you'll find it interesting that those uh, published expectations next month will most likely gravitate closer to uh, what this month's published forecast was. So you'll you'll see a shift in those expectations moving forward, barring any any additional major weather events. Okay, great. Uh, another question coming in, Lance, you mentioned other USDA agency using your data. What do these other USDA agencies do with these NAS reports? So one of our biggest customers is probably the Farm Service Agency. Uh, I, I think, you know, a lot of folks think about the data they collect, and you probably even think about some of the programs they administer, but you might not think about where they get the data uh, that they use to carry out some of those programs. And a lot of it comes from NAS. Um, now, they've made some shifts in some of the programs. It changes over time. But even the ARC and PLC programs, even though a lot of the yield information, they're, they're pushing more to RMA-type uh, products, they still need price information. Um, so even in programs where you might not think it's being used, uh, there's some other NAS information that they're tapping into there. RMA uh, does still use some NAS information for some of the insurance products that they administer. Um, a lot of the other programs over at FSA and they're, and they're constantly changing. Um, so it might be to carry out a program or it might be to help Congress decide what type of program to stand up in the upcoming farm bill. So we get a lot of requests that way as well. And of course, they're working closely with uh, agencies like FSA who have to administer those programs. 
Well, interesting when you uh, talked about the market reaction, obviously yesterday we, we closed higher on both commodities and here today um, we're also up again uh, fairly strongly in beans, up almost 19 cents for new crop and corn's up almost 11 cents on new crop. So um, the farmers in Indiana are not mad at you today. So. <laughs> well, that's a good thing. And I, and I think that just points out also, though, that even though the reports can have some impact on the on the prices in the short term, at the end of the day, the prices are, are ultimately going to be determined by supply and demand. And there's so many other factors that play into that. So even even when a, you know, a quote shocking report comes out and and maybe delivers a shock to the market, you know, the true impact of the report itself is going to be short lived and ultimately prices are going to settle back in to wherever they need to be based on all the conditions that are happening. And so it, even if that means they don't fully recover, it's not just because the report did or said something, it's because now folks have a better handle on where it needed to go. And so maybe it just is able to respond a little quicker than it otherwise would. As I mentioned, there's gonna be information out there eventually anyway. Um, and so this just gives everyone an opportunity to get on the same page and get there a lot quicker. All right. Well well, thank you again, Lance. We here at the Indiana Soybean Alliance and the Indiana Corn Marketing Council would like to thank you for taking your valuable time out of this busy schedule to speak to Indiana farmers and stakeholders about this important crop production report. Uh, we understand you're very busy. This thing was released just over 24 hours ago, and we look forward to the upcoming reports on how this crop progresses. Thank you again. All right, thank you, Ed, and you know, anytime, just happy to help out in any way I can. So I well, hope just, you all enjoy the rest of your meeting. Just let me in the building next August. All right, <laughs> I, I said my promise. All right, thanks again. Thanks, Mr. Honing, and I really appreciate that first slide uh, where it, you, know, you explained the need for having that open report. Uh, wanna bring in our, uh, one of our sponsors for today, uh, Bex Hybrids and Ashley. Um, Ashley Fisher with Bex Hybrids is going to provide some remarks. So Ashley, you're on. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, good afternoon and thanks to Lance and all the other speakers who are going to talk today that are sharing their knowledge and information. My name is Ashley Fisher. I'm the Marketing Operations Lead at Bex. Uh, when I look at what our farmers and their families are experiencing and have been experiencing the past two years, I'm really appreciative, um, as are uh, the Beck family, um, for what our organizations like the Indiana Corn Growers and Indiana Soybean Alliance, as well as other commodity associations, uh, what they do, um, especially events like today. Um, navigating today's world is easy, and we're just so grateful for the work that they do every day and advocating on behalf of farmers at both the state and national level. But before I go on, there's one more group that I want to thank, and that uh, is our farmers. Um, who are especially who are joining today. So farmers farming, um, I grew up on a farm and um, have been working in the industry for over 12 years that it's such a remarkable occupation and it's selfless and it's challenging and difficult, uh, but it is also so rewarding. Um, and so I wanna thank you for your hard work and dedication to one of our nation's greatest industries. As the largest independent uh, family-owned retail seed company in the United States, uh, Bex has grown to become the number one seed brand in Indiana, as well as the fourth largest brand in the United States. And when I was thinking about today in the webinar, one word really kept coming to mind, and that was connection. Connection to our industry and connection to fellow farmers. And I've heard Sonny Beck, who's our CEO, say many times that you will be the same today as you were yesterday, except for the books you read and the people you meet. And so in an industry, in a world that is constantly changing, webinars like this today, uh, with experts um, on various topics are giving us the opportunity to engage, learn, and make those connections. In my nearly 10 years um, of being a part of the Beck family of employees, I'm truly amazed at our growth, a growth that's been fueled by our why of helping farmers succeed. Our leadership and our employees make connections each day that are focused on providing the best seed products for each acre but we're also dedicated to delivering information that helps farmers make decisions to improve profitability, especially in environments that are constantly changing. 
Since 1964, we've had an agronomic research program called Practical Farm Research that has assisted farmers in finding new ways to better manage their farms and to increase ROI. We dedicate more than 800 acres at six of our own locations, as well as partnering with independent research companies and universities for a total of 12 testing sites across the United States. In fact, I want to personally invite you, if you're ever interested, um, we do private PFR tours at our, uh, independent, at our PFR uh, locations at each of them, um, as well as we're hosting our annual Technology Days here at the end of this month on August 25th through 20, 27th through the 29th. So I personally invite you, um, if you want more information, please go to our website uh, for all the details. But Bex is a company that's been built on the hard work, faith, and innovation of our family of employees and dealers. And our why is helping farmers succeed. And we all have different whys for why we do the jobs that we do. But I firmly believe that there is one thing that really unites all of us. Um, and that one thing isn't going to change and that's at the heart of it. Uh, we are all farmers. And so I wanna thank uh, the Indiana Corn Growers and Indiana Soybean Alliance for hosting today, our speakers for being available, and especially our farmers. Um, and now I'm gonna turn it back to, it's either Steve or Ed, I'm not sure, but one of you uh, to introduce our next speaker. Well, thank you, Ashley, uh, for those remarks. And uh, thank you uh, to Vex for their sponsorship. We really do appreciate that. Next up, we have uh, Mac Marshall with the United Soybean Board. Uh, Mac, thank you for the sponsorship, and uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Steve, um, and thanks to Lance for uh, his earlier comments. I'm actually uh, an alumnus of the federal statistical system, so uh, anytime you can kind of peel back the curtain a little bit and see all that goes into creating uh, this very much needed uh, market information. I, I, I think it's, it's always a great exercise. Um, so with that, let's, let's dive into it. I've got a couple comments on yesterday's report. Um, I always like to look at things from both the international and the domestic side as, you know, have, have dual responsibility for that as part of my purview working with USB and USEC. Um, so drilling in on the US, I think we've, we've hit this very, very hard um, record yield expectations coming out of yesterday's report and uh, basically a uh, record crop as well, fractionally less than 2018. Um, but uh, I, I wanna drill in on some of the other points that at least jumped out to me. Uh, one was seeing the upward revision to exports uh, for the 2021 marketing year added 75 million bushels of air, um, which I think is, is nice and reflective of the great sales pace that we've seen for, uh, for new crops, certainly over the past uh, six to eight weeks. And I have more detail on that in the subsequent slide. Um, we've also seen, you know, higher uh, expectations for exports for both meal and oil, um, both for the forthcoming marketing year and for the, the tail end of the 1920 marketing year. A lot of that is on the strength of really um, significant crush that we've had all, see, all, all uh, calendar year long, and I'll go into more detail on that in the subsequent slide. So if you look at the whole complex here, um, some, some good utilization in a, in a rebound year um, as we look to the new crop. Uh, flipping over to the international side, <clears throat> and uh, let's actually go back in time a little bit to July when we saw the WASD updates then. There were revisions to the Chinese balance sheet um, on the strength of forward purchases and expectations of higher imports over the course of the 1920 marketing year. We saw revisions to that uh, balance sheet for, uh, for both old and new crop. Um, Chinese demand and imports are revised at 3 million metric tons from July um, yesterday. Um, and that, you know, is, is going to be, you know, partially met across the major exporters. So upward revisions to Brazil and Argentina on their export side. And then, of course, uh, the aforementioned upward revisions for, uh, for us, uh, just over a million metric tons to translate into metric. What I think is also exciting and, and testament to the, the work that's being done in international marketing through uh, USAC is, um, is, is additional expansion for uh, some of our more, you know, frontier and emerging markets. Um, you know, drilling in a little bit more on the balance sheets that came out yesterday, we saw some nice upward revisions both for, uh, for um, current marketing year and 2021 uh, for uh, imports and demand on the, the bean and meal side for um, particularly Egypt and Thailand, which are two uh, emerging and uh, notable markets 
uh, for, for U.S. exports. Um, brush up pretty substantially there. The other thing is, is looking at the, uh, the current marketing year. Uh, Brazilian exports were, were revised up um, pretty significantly. Of course, there was a lot of uh, aggressive forward selling in the early half of the year, um, large part due to you know, a large crop in Brazil, sure, but also um, really weak currency that was uh, driving a lot more forward sales as farmers uh, in Brazil were getting paid in, uh, in record levels of local currency. So those are some of the international dynamics that at least jumped out to me as I was going through the balance sheets yesterday. Uh, next slide, please. I'm not going to belabor the point here, but um, just looking at the conditions reports that came in on Monday here um, that, you know, help factor into uh, the, the yield estimates as well. Um, we see, obviously, continuing improving conditions. Indiana did actually take, uh, you know, one percentage point back in its good excellent rating um, for week 32 versus week 31. Um, uh, next slide, please. Uh, and one of the things that I like to do whenever we have one of these crop reports come out, um, particularly when we get to that July, August, September timeframe, is, is reconcile uh, those crop size estimates with, um, at that point in time against uh, where the final estimates are. And, and really the chart on the left here, I think, uh, is, is a nice validation of how well thought out the timing and methodology and process are um, for yield and production estimates that, that NASA undertakes. You can see, you know, really strong fit between um, the August estimate and where final yield lands uh, on a U.S. level as a whole. Um, now, we, we have the estimate for this year, 4.425 billion bushels in, in crop size. Um, could be some modulation on that. Uh, I think especially in light of um, the weather events that we had ripple through Iowa earlier this week. Um, we talked about that earlier. That's not something that has uh, been integrated into the, uh, the aggregate production estimates. And, and certainly the crop conditions report that comes out Monday afternoon will, will bear monitoring. Uh, if we're going to drill in a little bit on Indiana specifically, next slide. Um, I, I like to look at the conditions as they prevail week by week and reconcile how that translates into final yield here. Um, you know, not, a, not a, a great fit there. I mean, the quantification is a little bit different, but just to give uh, some context, um, you know, certainly the good to, and excellent rating that we saw for Indiana for, um, for last week, 67%, uh, pretty, uh, pretty substantial, and definitely uh, one of the higher ends that we've seen, um, if you're looking at that historical data set uh, there, um, kind of on the right-hand side of the left-hand chart. But um, mirroring the exercise that we had there for the U.S. as a whole, um, let's look at the August yield estimate and reconcile that with the final yield estimate. It's not as great a fit as it is on a national level, but still pretty strong. Uh, and if you look at some of those recent crops that we've had that have been really, really large and very, very high yields, um, certainly 2016 and 2018 come to mind. Um, that's probably the pocket we're looking in, not just in terms of, of, of crop size, but also um, you know, where the August yield estimate is relative to final. Uh, next slide, please. I'm going to apologize in advance for this slide because this one is already out of date. Um, this is, uh, a, and, and simply due to, you know, just getting the slides done in time here, but um, I want to provide some context on export sales and pace and what we're looking at um, through the course of the year. So uh, ignore all the numbers on this, literally. Um, uh, what I'll say is for this most recent week, um, we had the export sales data come out this morning. And, uh, you know, more bullish news. And I think we're seeing that reflected in uh, the futures curve uh, today as well. Um, uh, Steve had talked about the 19 cent rally that we've seen for, for new crop beans. And I think, you know, uh, export sales are certainly playing a role in that. Uh, if we look at the past week, U.S. has added 1.1 million metric tons of uh, soy sale, uh, excuse me, of exports, um, more than half of which were going to China. And then um, more importantly, I think as we head into the, the tail end of this marketing year and the crossover on September 1st into the, into the new crop year, um, you know, we, we've got that continued excellent pace of new crop sales uh, to China and to other destinations. Um, so the, the analogous figures I have here, that second bullet says 1.4 million metric tons of new crop sales added 474,000 metric tons to China. Those, those figures for this week um, are, are really more than double in aggregate for the world, um, sending over 2.8 million metric tons in new crop sales, and uh, 1.7 million of which were destined for China. So um, if, if we're looking at that, that uh, 
right hand side chart at the bottom, we've got a nice uh, high set of bars uh, to the right of that that would, that would be on there. This was uh, timely. So we're putting it all together. If we think about new crop sales uh, to China as a whole, right now we're standing at uh, about 10.3 million metric tons of forward bookings for the fall. Um, the highest uh, you know, new crop sales that we've had at this point of the, of the marketing year for 49 weeks um, since, since we were uh, getting bookings in July 2014. So um, I think pretty substantial, not just reflective of, of um, you know, uh, compared to the immediate pre-trade war period, but, but really I think strong even before we got into that dynamic, if you want to go back to the middle part of a decade. Um, next slide, please. So as, as we think about, you know, the seasonal patterns of, of exports, um, you know, now, uh, you know, the, the latest expectations that came out of the WASD yesterday are for U.S. to export nearly, you know, 58 million metric tons, up substantially from the 1920 marketing year, um, you know, which is, has been challenging for a litany of reasons. Uh, I think, you know, we're all well aware of. There's the ongoing China issue. Um, we had the phase one deal signed in the early part of the year, but of course that was after the, the notable marketing window for U.S. soy. So, um, you know, the, the full advantages of that, at least as it pertains to the soy complex, haven't really been, been felt yet, at least in my estimation. Um, really, as we look to the fall, that, that's when um, I, I think we'd, we'd start to see some of the impacts of that um, as that aggregate export number comes up. And then to my earlier point about uh, Brazil and the export pace that we've seen over the course of the year, um, you can see the uh, the month by month exports that have come out of Brazil and just how high ab above um, even immediate prior year figures uh, that has been. Again, a lot of aggressive forward selling, but you can see that the Brazilian crop is already well sold um, over the course of the year. So, um, you know, again, as as we look back to the seasonal um, spike for for U.S., uh, that 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 will be favorable. Um, and more on that on the uh, next slide, actually. So here, this is looking at the Chinese import behavior, um, which and China imported record uh, 11 and change million metric tons in June, uh, again, predominantly from, from Brazil, but we were having some nice shipments there uh, that month. And uh, you, you can just reconcile the, the uh, seasonal import purchasing behavior where you know, China's effectively pivoting between the two notable suppliers in the US and Brazil. You've seen we've crossed the Brazil uh, peak selling season and crossing into where we are for the U.S. But if you're looking at the behavior from China, and I like to look back, you know, retrospectively as well. So over the past four years, if you're breaking down um, sales by quarter, you know, typically you've had a slight majority skew towards the second half of the year, which is where we as an exporter uh, really play. So I, I think the open question uh, as we look to uh, this, you know, uh, the close of the third quarter and, and then, you know, certainly the fourth quarter of the year post-harvest, um, will there be uh, kind of a, a material change in that split uh, between first half buying and second half buying, given all the aggressive purchasing that's happened that far? Naturally, um, we're hoping that the, the case is that that aggressive second half case uh, it does remain there. And I think um, that all the export sales data that we just talked through a little bit uh, ago, I'll, I'll speak to um, to uh, you know, some ample opportunity there. Uh, next slide, I want to pivot over to the domestic side just to give a, some market dynamics here. So I'd alluded to the uh, crush pace that we've had um, and, and some of the revisions that we saw on the meal and oil expectations for both export and domestic utilization, um, you know, particularly on the biodiesel side, which I don't think I mentioned, but there was a nice uh, upward revision to that on the U.S. balance sheet yesterday. Um, you see the monthly crush figures in that kind of tan line at the top, all trending above year prior and five-year average levels, uh, month after month after month. A lot of that is attributable to um, some increased uh, capacity that has come online in the past couple of years as we've had uh, newer plants and retrofits going on. Um, certainly good to have more of those uh, domestically oriented uh, disappearance channels. Um, if you uh, don't take a month by month look and really just look at the first half, you can see how aggressive the crush has been over this period. Um, you know, uh, it, it's allowed for uh, some higher exports of, of value added soybean oil. Uh, also soybean oil going uh, in, in higher and higher rations into, um, in, into uh, biodiesel as a feedstock. And actually on that, let's, let's flip over to, uh, to the next two slides here because I think this is a nice integration of that. So um, on the oil side, well, here's, the, here's what the inventories look like. Um, 
domestically, certainly as we've had a lot of crush. Uh, on the meal side, it's, it's backed up a little bit as, um, you know, animal ag certainly took uh, a, a pretty substantial hit in the in the, the, the pace of production in the middle part of the year it is rebounding uh, overall. If you look at hog slaughter over the course of the year, and I, I think Will is, is going to get into uh, elements of this in his presentation. Um, if you look at hog slaughter, you know, through the first, you know, few months of the year, we had a significant downturn in, in, uh, in March and in April. Um, but, you know, the resilience of the industry has really allowed for, uh, a, you know, a degree of a rebound back here, at least in terms of processing capacity. But what it's meant for meal inventories is with that coupled, coupled with that higher crush, um, a little bit of a build there. But on the oil side, um, we've had a lot more disappearance into, uh, into biodiesel as well, because um, with that somewhat of an abatement in, uh, in, in, in hog slaughter in the middle part of the year, um, decreased availability for you know, yellow, yellow grease as a, as a feedstock. And, and that's allowed for a little bit more disappearance on the soybean oil side, which has been nice for our complex. Uh, next slide, please. So, yeah, putting it, putting that, uh, I, I, get, I guess a visualization of that last point I, I just made there. So if we look at domestic soybean oil disappearance for biodiesel, um, you know, we're up almost 4% from last year and, and almost 20% from two years ago. Um, uh, latest figures for, uh, for May, you know, had the highest monthly use of the past three years. And that's, and you also see reflected there some of the downward trend for, uh, for the animal fats that uh, have been uh, used, or animal fats and, and spent um, cooking oil as uh, reclaimable grease uh, used in the biodiesel sector. Um, last slide here, so a lot of this is focused kind of on near-term dynamics, but I always want to end with a, a longer-term perspective here. You know, if we look at, you know, global soybean consumption and uh, break it down between U.S. and international here, um, really, the, the pace of, uh, as we look at the, the forthcoming marketing year um, is, is a pretty substantial increase in demand. Um, so world demand, year-on-year uh, -year growth, at least as predicated by yesterday's WASD, over 16 million metric tons, well above the 10-year trend. And you see that reflected as well in, uh, on both the U.S. side and the international side. So I think the, the takeaway here is that, you know, whatever the near-term market conditions uh, are, and... Um, you know, I'd say up until the rally that we've had over these past couple of days, um, you know, prices have been, you know, low and treading water, but um, certainly seeing uh, this uptick on the demand side and, you know, more aggressive, uh, you know, buying out of, out of major import markets um, is uh, certainly all good signs and, and more testament to the, uh, the uh, underlying, uh, I'd say, strong global fundamentals that uh, lead to this, you know, in, uh, you know, high level of aggregate demand. Um, with that, I know, uh, I, I think I've reached uh, my time here, um, so uh, I'll, I'll pitch it back to, uh, to Ed and Steve to introduce our next speaker, but I want to thank all of you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Max, for that insight, and thank you for the sponsorship, USB, and thanks for all you do for Indiana uh, soybean farmers and soybean farmers across the country. So, Ed, next, next guest. Yeah, um, real quickly here, Will Sawyer is, our, is the lead animal protein economist at CoBank's Knowledge Exchange Research Division, where his focus is on providing market and industry research for pork, poultry, and beef sectors. Will, we appreciate you taking time to talk with Indiana farmers and stakeholders, and if we can, continue to send in your questions, and at the end of our presentation, uh, we'll do a Q&A with our, with our presenters. So, Will, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, uh, thank you all for the invitation to, to say a few words. Uh, appreciate the, the corn and soybean producers of Indiana. Um, I grew up in, in North Carolina, if you couldn't tell by my accent, so I'm glad to be in fellow basketball fever country, uh, assuming we ever get to play another game of college basketball, but we can all hope, right? Uh, but appreciate the invitation to say a few words. Um, we have a lot to talk about in the protein market, so uh, whether we're talking feed or animal. So, so let's uh, go ahead and get right into it in the uh, next slide. Um, when I look at the, the USDA report um, yesterday, I think at least as it comes to the animal protein, I kind of think about the movement that we saw in production uh, in the back half of, of this year as kind of moving of the deck chairs to some degree. Um, overall production growth is still looking very consistent at around 1.2% total protein growth. Um, it is pretty amazing to, 
to still see growth for this year from, you know, from Max comments about, you know, the disruption in our beef and pork plants that we saw in the spring, uh, pretty amazing to see, you know, beef production down double digits in the second quarter, um, and actually going to see year over year growth in the third quarter and obviously the fourth quarter um, as well. And so overall, we're, you know, we're, we have to kind of give our industry a lot of credit here, whether you're talking about beef, pork, or chicken, that they've been able to manage through a, a period of historic volatility and, you know, the, the phrase of disruption is something that we think of Amazon, right, of, of disrupting supply chains and, and markets. Uh, COVID, I think, did uh, a fair amount of disruption, but our industry is, is back in business, to say the least. Um, when I think about in the back half of the year, I think it's really interesting to see poultry production mostly flat, maybe down a little bit versus a year ago. Um, we always wonder how the poultry sector is going to respond to market forces from a supply standpoint. Rational supply is always uh, the best supply, right? And to see, I think, somewhat of a, a contraction in supply that what we saw over the last month and a half on the poultry sector is a very good sign. Because as you can tell, when it comes to beef and pork, a lot of those sectors are, are in the period of trying to work through the glut of, uh, of cattle and hogs that materialized in the second quarter. We saw 3 million hogs that should have been processed that weren't, a million cattle. So as a result, the red meat sector is trying to make up for what we lost in the, in the second quarter. And you're seeing they're doing that, they're doing that this quarter and in spades. Uh, when we think about 2021, obviously there's a lot of volatility there. Um, we're not used to seeing in the protein markets double digit volatility, but we're, we're going to see that obviously in the first half of next year as we're comparing to pretty big numbers in the first half, uh, big swings in the first half of 2020. But in general, you'll notice that the supply growth isn't actually slowing from where we were this year. Uh, we're seeing 1.4% growth versus 1.2% growth in 2020. I think that does mask to some degree the contraction that we're expecting in the meat industry as we think about the back half of, of 2021 and 2022 and, and very possibly in 2023. So a lot of that is year-over-year -year comparison. We do see some stress in the industry. And I'll probably spend um, most of the, of the next few slides kind of talking about where we see that and kind of what that means to, to feed demand um, going forward. So next slide, please. Um, the first element I think that was really important in the report was kind of taking stock of where we see livestock weights, whether that's uh, red meats or on the poultry side of things. We saw in the month of, of months of May and June, real expansion in weights across the board. I think that was the lever that every producer pulled to be able to keep the volume as high as possible, while at the same time making up for the fact that plants were still not operating normally and capacity still wasn't back to normal. We still see that today. We still see red meat plants operating at the 90 to 95% capacity utilization. They're making up for that by operating a lot more Saturdays than they would have normally. But we do see weights becoming more and more current, especially on the, on the pork side of things. I think that's somewhat of an indication of some of the success that producers have had in feeding maintenance rations that have really worked to slow down the growth curve. I, I know we are always focused on productivity in agriculture, but we were able to pull a real unproductive lever um, over the last few months that has really helped us slow down the supply chain in a really unusual way. It's kind of like we've gone back to the 80s when it comes to our, um, and to our feed conversion as a result of the plant shutdowns. It was the right move, but obviously you can see our weights are getting much more current on the poultry side of things, very interesting to see weights down year over year. I see that as a real tell of still weakness in the food service sector. I, I think still weakness in some of the big bird plants across the country. But right now when we see uh, animal numbers so far above prior year levels, I think it's really important for us to keep those weight numbers in check. The last thing we need is to see the cutout fall any further than what we saw a few weeks ago, uh, that was starting to, to be a little bit concerning about how domestic demand was looking um, in the U.S. market. Speaking of markets, let's go to the next slide and talk about some of the non-U.S. markets. And to, to piggyback on, on Max comments on the market that really is telling the story for U.S. protein um, is China, of course. You know, when you look at the first half of the year, 
we're going to have sent three times more animal protein in the Chinese market than what we did in the first half of 2019. So when we talk about the phase one agreement, and, I'm, and obviously protein isn't the only component of the phase one agreement with China, when it comes to protein, we've got a pretty good story to tell, right? It's almost 800,000 um, tons sent in the first half of the year. What's interesting in the USDA report is that while, and yeah, I've got it highlighted here in the data, is that they're thinking about more of a return to normal in the back half of the year. So for example, with pork, instead of you know the 28%, 27% growth we saw in the first half, they're expecting that rate of growth to slow significantly in the back half of the year. Beef, things getting better, chicken slowing down. And so this kind of normalization, I think maybe wishful thinking on the beef side of things, but on the pork side of things, I don't see a lot of indication to say that we're gonna see a massive slowdown in our shipments to the most important market in this story and into China. We, we still see historic high hog prices in China. Um, we see that changing over time, but that, may, that might take months, maybe quarters. Um, I don't think that's gonna to interrupt that trade flow from a supply and demand standpoint, not a political standpoint. I, I'm not in the political um, forecasting business for obvious reasons, but from a supply and demand standpoint, we still think there's every reason out there for the Chinese to be buying the large volumes that we've seen um, so far this year. And, and the U.S. has been a big winner. Um, our volumes obviously have tripled so far. And if you look at global supplies of protein into China, they're up by 75%. So we're doing very well. We are losing some share in some other markets. I think the most important market for us to focus on, not that we need any bad news right now, is, is on the Mexican market. Uh, Mexico has been a really important market for, for decades now, prior to USMCA, back when we had that thing called called NAFTA. And, um, and even at that time, if you look at our trade flows um, of, of protein into, into Mexico, um, they, we do see some slowing in the, in the first half of the year, especially when you look at, um, when you look at beef and you look at pork. You know, we don't wanna lose that market too much because we have a strategic advantage there. It's called a, a border. And, that is, and that's still an advantage for us. And so when we think about the macro weakness in Mexico, when we think about their protein production growth in Mexico, that does make me think a little bit in a constructive way about the, the outlook for our trade flows there. That's still a market I think that we, that we can't lose sight of. Japan and Korea, very strategic markets and still doing okay despite our, our growth into China. And I think that's a very good sign for us to see. So all is quiet for the time being on the, international front. So let's bring it back home in the next slide here. When we think about, you know, the outlook for, for protein demand domestically, and I think the outlook for profitability for the livestock sector in general, we really need to think about the two levers of, of food service demand and retail demand. And food service is on the left and retail is on the right. Let's start with food service because that's not as great of a story. You can see that food, uh, foot traffic within the full service restaurant uh, end of the of food service was very weak, obviously, when we were all sitting at home wondering what was gonna happen to the world, not just the United States. And, and obviously things have improved significantly since then. One date that's important to probably half of us on the phone right now is Father's Day. Um, that was about as good as it got when it came to the improvement um, in, in foot traffic within food service. And since then, it hasn't really continue to improve, unfortunately. I think however we want to quantify the impact of the second wave when it comes to food service and protein demand, that's where we're a little bit concerned. So I think this is very important for us to watch. Obviously, we're not going back to where it was in March, but it's not the continued improvement that we would like to see this time of year when everybody's on vacation and hopefully eating all the protein they can get their hands on. So other side of, of, of consumption on protein, retail, Retail was quite a hot story. I know we all were, were watching those meat prices get crazy expensive um, earlier in the year, and we still see inflation um, in the green section of the column there. You still see double-digit inflation. What's good, in my opinion, to see is that supplies of protein are back in the meat case. And whether you're talking beef, pork, and chicken, what was a real disruption and drove actual negative 
volume uh, availability for the consumer is now back, and, and I think that's really good to see. The last thing we need is an empty refrigerator when it comes to protein. I think we can all agree there. So next slide, and, and I think this might be, yes, my, my last slide. This, I work for a bank, CoBank, obviously, we're a, a proud member of the farm credit system, so I have to talk about profitability. It's obligatory, I think. Um, and it's unfortunately not that great of a story, I think, especially on the pork side of things. I, I have to use the build it, they will come analogy in the pork sector. We've all expanded pork production in every state, maybe other than my home state of North Carolina. But nevertheless, we've really expanded production and we built it and they've come, right? And we see these Chinese exports or exports to China uh, really materializing. What this says to me is that from a supply and demand standpoint is that we, we either need to see continued expansion of, of exports, not just in the back half of 2020, but going forward, or we may need to see some rationalization of production over the next few years. Well, time will tell which one makes the most sense. On the other species, you can see the volatility in the beef side of things there in the, in the dark blue. Um, however you want to quantify the volatility, it wasn't really a, a great year so far for cattle feeders. That's not new news. But what's, I think, really interesting is still seeing um, packing margins contracting. And so when we look at our customers on the beef and pork packing side of things, those margins have contracted. And it makes us really think about the fact that wages are much higher than where they were a year ago. PPE costs are a lot higher, of course than where they were prior to COVID. And so we kind of think about a lot of stress in the supply chain. And, and I think the producer is seeing a lot of that, of that pressure. Talk about poultry for a second. As you can see there, that's a few cents per pound margin um, on a cash basis. I know that's better than losing money, but as we all know in the chicken business, if you're not making money in the summer, it's gonna be a long winter and a long fall, right? And I think that's something that we have to think about. So when you put all those variables together, that makes us think about somewhat of a, of a peak in production on protein in 2020, 2021, and then some, uh, some contraction from there. So I believe that's my last slide other than the next one, which has my contact information. You know where to find me, phone or email. But Ed, I appreciate the, the few minutes to say a few words. Thank you so much. Hey, thank you so much. Not bad for a Wake Forest grad. <laughs> ACC at its finest. <laughs> well, probably academically for sure. I don't so, know. Um, Thanks, anyway, <laughs> getting out of those uh, interconference, intercollegiate conference discussions, uh, we're going to jump right to uh, John Bays, and we did have questions coming in, Will. So, um, uh, John Bays is president of John Bays and Associates. Uh, he's leveraged his 38 years plus of working in global markets on behalf of soy, U.S. soybeans and the United States Soybean Export Council for many years he's been with them. So John, thank you for taking the time today to share your thoughts on the August USDA reports. Thank you very much. Um, it's good to be with you. Uh, I think that uh, the, you, you may be surprised at what I'm saying with my first slide, the outlook for you as it's not, industry is not always bad. The fact is uh, you talk to farmers in the last few months, wouldn't be saying, well, my gosh, these prices are terrible. I don't know if I'm making any money on them or whatever. And so it's easy to see the negative side. But I think you need to, a lot of things that are going on that are positive, even with COVID-19 and the problems we've had with China. Uh, we're going to have a high, uh, a record high soybean yield in 2020, according to what USDA projects. Uh, yes, that causes a problem of increase in supply, but you're always a lot better to have more of something uh, if you uh, to sell, and I think that with the like today we're seeing price increases, you're going to be looking at three, four, five bushels on average out there. Looks like to for people to uh, 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 extra production this year, and that's income that uh, they're looking at now. Uh, global soy demand is continuing to grow rapidly. Uh, global soy demand in 2021 is forecasted to be almost 16 million tons, greater than in 2019-20. Uh, and 25.4 million tons greater than 2018-19. Put that in perspective, 15.97 uh, million tons is more than the soy production of Paraguay and Uruguay and probably Bolivia, which are three of the big suppliers in the world. Uh, and the 25.35 million tons is bigger than uh, 
India, Paraguay, and uh, Uruguay combined. Uh, so that's a lot of growth. Uh, China soybean imports in 2021 expected to be 16.46 million tons greater than 20, uh, should be 2018 19. Uh, that's a lot of growth in uh, soybean imports in China. Now, they may not have come from the U.S., but with the big crops we've got in South America and elsewhere, anything that China, uh, the more they consume, the better off we are. Um, in uh, U.S. soybean exports in 2021 are for forecasted to be 475 million bushels greater than in 2019-20. I mean, that's a, a big step up. And U.S. soybean meal and soy oil exports are also forecasted to be strong in 2021. So all three legs of that demand out there are look good for 2021 for the U.S. soybean industry. Next slide. Uh, uh, this is a strange one to bring up, but it's the reality. The odds favor weather problems in South America at some point here. Uh, the major reason we've got these big supplies worldwide is almost unprecedented string of big crops of the U.S. and South America. Some of that's because of genetics, just much better uh, yielding varieties now than we had a few years ago. The last bad crop in the U.S. was in 2012, except for 2019 when the wet weather caused a a lot of area not to get planted, but we've had really good yields in our soybeans since 2012. Argentina has had one bad crop in 2018 in the last seven years. Brazil has harvested big crops in the last eight straight years. That is unprecedented. I cannot look back at history and find any time when we had Brazil produce that many good crops in a row. So the odds uh, favor either Brazil or Argentina not having a good crop in 2021, maybe the U.S. That's particularly the case with the development of La Nina weather pattern in South America, uh, which is going to likely, uh, more likely to affect Argentina than Brazil, uh, but it can affect Brazil as well. And another factor here that I think is pretty key is that economists that are surveyed out there th expect Brazil's currency, the real, to strengthen over the next year. That will reduce Brazilian farmer income and reduce this export competitiveness. While we're looking at these prices here that are really low uh, from what we've experienced in the past years, Brazilian farmers have been getting record incomes uh, from their soybeans because of a weak currency. So they, in dollar terms, they're not getting more, but in local currency, they've been getting record high um, prices per bushel. Uh, and that has really been a factor of why they've expanded like they have and why they've been so aggressive in exporting into the world market. Um, well, it's a real problem. If anybody can remember back into the 80s, the thing that uh, really killed the farm economy then was a, a high value dollar. And back then, high interest rates. Fortunately, we don't have high interest rates to go with the high value dollar. But the dollar has been weakening lately. Our competitor's currency in Brazil is strengthening somewhat. Uh, and in Argentina, uh, as seems like we, all the ways the case with Argentina, they're always in some uh, form of misery in their economy. Um, next slide is uh, one that I'd like to show here that this is based on spot soybean prices as of yesterday. As you can see, the U.S. soybeans, the Gulf, for $360.75 $360 metric ton. Whereas Brazil is 392.75, uh, U.S. price uh, the PNW 375.25, which is still like $15 uh, or $17 a ton cheaper than Brazil, and the freight from the PNW to China and, and Asia is a whole lot less than going from Brazil. In Argentina, it's uh, 361.25. It's rare when you find U.S. soybeans priced the Gulf cheaper than Argentine soybeans, uh, but again. Um, that's a much better price for the U.S. because there's at least a $10 a ton discount for Argentine beans because of lower protein. On soy meal, uh, we're still the highest price at $343 compared to $337.75 uh, out of Brazil, but that's really close. When you start looking at freight rates into Europe and elsewhere, our meal starts looking pretty good uh, as a uh, meal. So, just in the last three or four weeks, we've really seen the U.S. price come down uh, and um, at Fob the Gulf, 
And I think that's a positive of what we're going to uh, see in terms of sales, because we're already seeing some pretty big sales booked out of the U.S. going into Europe. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is a long-term trend, and like what I like to look at is uh, those dots indicate what the um, global consumption of soybeans was in those uh, years. Now, and just for the matter of uh, looking at the future, I've taken a trend line there, but I've extended it out for 10 years into the future. And if we continue to grow along that, uh, at that trend, we're going to need 80, maybe 90 million tons of soybeans additional in 10 years. That's a lot of soybeans. I mean, we're talking about uh, of the total production of Brazil, Paraguay, and, and Uruguay that we're going to need additional demand in uh, um, down the road in uh, uh, 10 years. So the opportunity is there. Um, Someone's going to come along here to, to uh, tighten up supply and demand in terms of weather. Uh, we know Brazil is Argentina good, particularly Brazil. They've got additional land to plant, uh, and we know that they're going to be tough competitors. But before we sort of uh, uh, cry about this, we've got to remember the U.S. soybean industry is also extremely competitive. It's getting better. We're getting higher yields. Uh, and we're, I think we're going to be able to compete very well in the future. Uh, the next slide, if there is one. I forgot if I have one or not. Um, this, that's the last one. I'll just stop it at that point. Uh, like I say, I, I actually have worked for the soybean industry for 40 years uh, this year. And it always just amazes me that every year, no matter when the challenges we face, we manage to always find a, the best opportunity out in the world market. And I think that's happening because um, as Mac indicated earlier, we're making huge sales right now for soybeans. We had addition, a daily soybean sales announced for the last seven days. Uh, that's good. And, um, you know, China needs to import about 96 million tons of soybeans in a year. That's 8 million tons a month. We've got four months coming up here when we're going to be the one that's about the only key supplier to them. That's 32 million tons that we could export to China. And I think we could get up to that 32, 35 million tons between now and the 1st of February. And that'll do a lot to use up our crop. Thank you. All right, that's great news, uh, John. Appreciate that that uh, perspective and outlook. I think the market's agreeing with you today. So uh, we do have uh, we do have some questions here uh, from our group. So this first question is going to go to Mac. It's uh, <clears throat> it says FSA data released yesterday showed a dramatic drop from normal reporting of acres. Oops. Um, is the market struggling with this at all? And what impact will this uncertainty have going forward? Yeah, so um, I, I think one of the things that I've always tried to reconcile, I think even going back to my time in the private sector is, is how to integrate that FSA data. So um, I, I assume we're referring to the 1.2 million acre drop in, uh, in, in soy um, in, in terms of prevent plantings. Uh, which I think would be the third highest, at least in the past decade, certainly behind last year when we were beset by um, by wet weather and, and had over, I think, 4 million acres not planted of soy. And uh, in 2015, which was also a really wet spring, and I think we had maybe 2.2 million acres not not planted that. Um, I, I, I think that, you know, we look at the price rally that we've seen over the past couple of days, and I think that... Um, you know, there's there's one component of that, which is is how is the market trying to process and understand what that that you know comparatively high prevent plant figure uh, is saying and how to true up the true production. Now, over the next couple months, uh, commence or, or concurrently with uh, with each of the crop production reports, we'll have the revisions to the FSA data. I mean, that won't be uh, final until until January when um, you know, so the crop will have been harvested, and I think everything will have been. Uh, you know, process at that point. Um, but uh, it, it's definitely another key data point uh, to look at um, month to month going forward. And, and it is certainly a high number. And I think that is part of what's giving some of the price lift uh, right now. Great. Uh, the next question is to Will. Uh, USDA is forecasting uh, a jump in Chinese demand for soybeans. Um, here in the US, we still hear about China still um, 
dealing with the ASF issue in their own country, and the hog herd is only slowly recovering, what's driving this additional demand for soybeans? Yeah, I, I think um, the the questioner is is definitely spot on with the idea that ASF is still a really big problem. Um, but the uh, you know I guess that saying of the best the best problem for high prices is is high prices or solution for high prices. And and I think we are in that high price environment. You know, hog, hog prices in China took a little bit of a dip in in April and May, but they are they are back. Um, and I think the incentive for producers to um, to go into I think to go into a, a mindset of losing a third to a half of their production due to ASF and that they will still be able to make money um, says to them that they can feed a lot of animals that may not ever make it to market. Um, and whether that's corn or meal, um, that's a that's going to drive a lot of feed demand. And and you know we're really in a period right now in China of um, of, of revolution, you know, obviously this is an industry that has had very interesting feeding practices over the years uh, when it comes to hogs. Um, and so they're in a period where they're, they're finding a commercialization of, of hog production in a way that we've known here for decades. And so that's driving increased uh, feed demand, but at the same time, they're becoming much more efficient in their feed conversion. And so you have these polar opposite um, variables happening at the same time. You know, I think it was interesting that just this morning, the USDA announced their first uh, public estimates for 2021 uh, pork production in China. Um, they're expecting production to be up, you know, 9%, which is obviously still far from where they were prior to the ASF outbreak, um, so far from where they were in 2018. But what's interesting is they're also calling for a, a decline in pork imports to the tune of about 14%. So while things are great, and I think you know trade flows will continue continue to flow for U.S. protein in, into China, uh, we do kind of need to think about you know if 2020 is that high water mark where we kind of go from here. All right, great, thanks. The next question is to John: What does it take to move prices back to levels U.S. farmers can be profitable at? And I think you sort of touched on this in your in your presentation. Well, yeah, I think uh, clearly you just have to look at the global stocks. I mean, we're projected to have over 600 million bushels on on demand to enter next year. The world supply is huge uh, because of crops. Ultimately, what's going to happen is, I mean, maybe we'll get some boost to that out of greater demand than we expect, but it has to take weather problems somewhere to kind of pull down those supplies to where the prices reach the incentive to to, for profitability of farmers. I mean, I don't know when that's going to change, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, this is an unprecedented, when you look over the last eight years, uh, nobody with the exception of Argentina in one year had a bad crop. The rest of them, their yields have been very high in all those countries, uh, and we've just kept the world flooded with soybeans. Uh, and quite honestly, in maybe some respects, it's surprising that we're still as good a shape as we are. But we really haven't gotten prices down to where it's been sufficient to cut back on the plantings anywhere. Um, so we'll see. I just uh, I want to add one little element, though, to the last question about soy meal in, in China. Um, those hog operations that are going in, they're huge new operations are moving up into the northeast primarily into Jilin, Shandong, and Hailing Zhong provinces where they're putting the biggest new operations. Those are state-of-the-art operations. Uh, the little guys are pretty well out of business. They were ruined by the uh, uh, swine fever. So what's happening, these new operations are going business. They're putting a lot more soybean meal in their feeds than those little guys did. And that's one of the reasons we're seeing uh, strong demand for soy meal is because they're just better um, feed uh, inclusion of, of soy meal in the feeds. Okay, so it took the backyard guy out and consolidated that at a industrial scale. Right. All right good. All right, uh, last question, and this is for all three of you. So we'll start out with Mac, go to Will, and then, then John. The next question is, is, in your opinion, do you, you think we have printed the high corn production estimate and then also, do you think we have printed the high soybean production estimate? 
So um, I'll, I'll leave the corn one uh, alone for right now. Um, it, <laughs> just, just speaking on behalf of the checkoff here. Um, you know, I, I think what came out yesterday, you know, we, we, and I think particularly after Lance's presentation, it, it all gives us, um, I think, a good sense of all the diligence that goes into actually creating those yield estimates and the expectations uh, for production here. Um, but I do think it, it, it bears repeating that, you know, in the time since those estimates were compiled, there have been, you know, some weather disruptions here in the U.S. Um, and, uh, you know, part, I think another, just some of the things I've seen over the wire over, uh, you know, regarding, um, you know, price appreciation these past couple of days, some of it goes out to the 10 to 14 day forecast as well. I mean, we had some timely rains in here and everything, which have led to uh, improving crop conditions over the past couple of weeks, which have, you know, bucked consensus pre, uh, pre-release pre market um, market views. Um, so you, you put all that together, and um, I, I think there's a possibility we come down a little bit when we get to this uh, September revision and everything. But um, going going back to the the point that I'd raised on on that uh, that scatter plot chart, I mean the August figure generally does coincide very well with the final yield. So um, while we might come down a little, um, there's a possibility that uh, it's it's not. I don't think it's going to be anything that's that's really substantial. But um, then again, I'm not a plant physiologist, so I'm we shall see. You, I'm going to put you as a strong maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I, I could have said, I, 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 that, that's economy of language then. <laughs> I could learn a thing or two. All right, Will, what do you, yeah. what do you think? No, no, no. I, I, I like those thoughts. I think, um, I think that's a very rational uh, way of thinking of Max. I'm, and I think, you know, we, we have to keep our fingers crossed. I think, obviously, we're off to a, um, you know, a, a pretty good level at this point. Um, obviously, the disruptions of the last couple of weeks, you know, um, maybe may overstate the their impact, um, at least from the way some of the headlines have read. Um, but I think from from, you know, I think Ed and you and I maybe agree here. There, there definitely is. If things stay on the track they are, at least on the soy side, we could see some upward revisions. Fingers crossed. Okay. Okay, John. Yeah, I, I'm a consultant to soybeans, but I don't I'm not employed by them, so I can actually say a little more on, on corn. Uh, I'd have to be out in the Midwest to see what's happened, particularly in Iowa, Nebraska, and Illinois. But I can't help but think that you've got 90 mile an hour winds for quite a long time on corn. That there wasn't a lot of uh, uh, breakage of those stalks, and that probably will never. I mean, they're not going to mature into corn. I think there's a chance that that, that you see that you, I mean, this was a high water mark on corn, it might go down because there were 8 to 10 million acres of corn that were subject to those winds and I, I just have to think that it's an impact. Now with respect to beans, uh, yeah, uh, we'll have to see, but you know, fortunately for them, they're a lot shorter and uh, they didn't get hit by that and they're not going to see the kind of breakage that you're going to probably see in corn. Uh, so. Uh, I think there's a, still a potential that you could see a little higher yield in uh, um, uh, come out of soybeans. Yeah, quite honestly, I was surprised at, at USDA's number yesterday for soybeans. Normally, I, I was saying people I thought it'd be 51, 51 and a half because USDA does tend to kind of move up in stages. But uh, if they jump straight to 53.3. Uh, that tells you that crop out there is excellent and it could get bigger. Yep. Well, put me, I, I get paid by both corn and soybeans. So uh, I'm, I'm going to go with, uh, I'm going to go with uh, the, the corn number gets smaller as we go forward. And I'm in the same camp with the, uh, the other three here. I think beans have some upside potential still. It's going to depend on what that, uh, uh, fourth week of August and first week of September weather looks like, but there we go. All right, Steve, we're way over, so I'm going to throw it back to you. Well, thank you, Ed, and thank you, Will, John, and Mac for that insight. That's uh, I have definitely a lot of information to absorb, and we really do appreciate you taking time to provide your insight to this, and appreciate uh, the time you've taken. Uh, just a few closing remarks. We, we can't do this without our, our sponsors. Uh, again, today it was Bex and the United Soybean Board. Thanks again for the sponsorship of today's event. 
we also can't do it without our members. We have a lot of farmer members on today. Uh, thank you for the members that are on. If you're not a member, uh, please consider joining. Uh, we've got a special going on right now. You can do a joint membership for $150 a year, and we will send out information uh, as a follow-up to this meeting for the uh, membership. So just please consider joining. Uh, some events coming up. We have uh, next week, we have uh, a shop talk with U.S. Representative Jim Baird. And uh, we also have one next, next week with um, uh, Senator Mike Braun. Um, there, it's gonna be in Jasper County. So I'm gonna be up in uh, Tippecanoe County and Jasper County next week. And we're working on uh, firming up uh, shop talks with our uh, other members of our delegation. So be watching for inf additional information on those. And again, I do want to mention uh, we will be at Technology Days, Ashley. So uh, be sure to stop by and and see us at uh, at Technology Days later this month. Again, Congressman Pence and Walorski, and we have this new program on our uh, with our checkoff, both corn and soybean checkoffs, the um, the moving the pile uh, series, and this is a uh, uh, this is a program that's. Uh, uh, hosted by a farmer, so you get that farmer perspective. Uh, we just talked through some of the uh, programs that, that we have uh, with the checkoff and uh, learn more about how we're using checkoff dollars to improve um, um, farming uh, farmers' uh, lives here in, in Indiana. But uh, just the information here, just sign up for that. Um, just had one go out uh, yesterday with Ed's uh, perspective on the crop report. Uh, but we will cover other uh, checkoff programs, learn more about how um, we're moving that pile. And thanks again for joining. Uh, be looking for other web other webinars, but again, thanks uh, to our presenters. Uh, thanks to our farmers and have a good day. <laughs>